it's a go so uh and matt welcome so uh so for today what we have is uh introduction to the chaos community uh this is the acronym for community health analytics for open source software um so i had uh, uh a great pleasure to to meet matt and, and georg uh, from 2016 2017 uh when all these projects started so this was announced in september 2017 in la one of the open source summits by the linux foundation um so matt is a professor at the university of nebraska at omaha and, and georg is now currently holding the position of director of sales in Viterbi, and both are running and sharing the chaos project so where are you ready Thank you for having us today. Just to make sure you can hear me. Can you? We can hear you. Excellent. So the what we want to talk about is community health metrics data. And as Diane said, it's a nice segue from what um, we were just discussing at the end of the last uh, session. Um, so, the community health, what we mean by that is that we want to look and understand at the potential that our open source projects and communities can continue developing quality software. And in, when we look at the literature, there are different ways that we can look at communities to understand if they have everything they need. We can look at the code, make sure that it is of high quality. We can look at the community to understand who are the people involved, are they being active, is there good diversity? And we can look at the resources, make sure that our communities and projects have the finances to pay for the servers or if they need special infrastructure, that everything we need for our communities is in place. Or as we heard in the last session, the commons, that the commons is healthy. And this is a matter of issue for a lot of different stakeholders. The users of software they don't want to be exposed to vulnerabilities like we had with Heartbleed or Equifax with hundreds of millions of data being exposed because there was a vulnerability in open source software and that wasn't fixed in time. Organizations care to minimize their risks, but also to leverage their influence and impact um, and have an assessment of how they're doing in the communities. The communities themselves care because they want to be inviting places for their community members and they want to, um, just as contributors, enjoy the work that they're doing. Foundations who are doers of open source projects and communities, they care about the health of their projects because it can give them an indication whether they need to have interventions. Or it can also help them identify where the best practices are, learn from that, and then help other communities in their portfolio to become better as well. And researchers, naturally, they, they want to understand the world. They also want to understand communities and the health of communities. and they might even have their own open source projects that they care about. Now, interesting thing that Jeb said, there are experts that we can call on to make decisions. And when it comes to community health, it's a very complex topic. And there are very few super experts who can look at an open source project and understand how it's doing, understand the community, and Identify ways to improve the health, know where work is needed. And so because this requires a very specific skill set with lots of experience working in open source for many years, it's 
really hard now uh, with open source growing. We have seen an influx of organizations and companies coming into open source. And there are lots of people who are just learning what open source is, how the communities work and so on. So we need to take that knowledge of community health and come up with a different way that it's more accessible to everyone. And this is what this talk is about, how together we can be better, stronger, faster for understanding community health. This better, stronger, faster comes from uh, a TV show, The Six Million Dollar Man, where the person was assembled and improved through bionics. And we can do this together. We can figure out how, what is community health? How can we understand it so that we all can be better, stronger, faster? And so let's walk through, start with together. The chaos community is this place where we can work on this together. We started this project in 2017 at the Linux Foundation to create analytics and metrics to help understand community health, to have procedures and practices that we can share and understand together. And so it's a group of industry professionals and academics and open source practitioners from a variety of different projects and companies that come together and Chaos is the platform to talk through the thorny issues of what is community health and how do we assess it. And in this work, we are building practices to become better. We want to become better at understanding communities at scale. And we do this through metrics. Just like organizations have been empowered to grow in size because they're using and leveraging metrics to understand their what's happening throughout the organization. And open source communities have grown to be some of them massive with thousands and thousands of people working at the same time, super collaborative, lots of work gets done. But you can no longer understand the health of the community just by being there. You need to have help. And that is what we try to do with metrics and analytics. And we want to have this objective data to reduce bias in decision-making, to identify places where we can work on our community's help improve. And so we use this data to make decisions and be data driven in our management. And this can also help us to have a strong foundation for shared decision making because we can understand the community through the data together better than if we all relied on our own object, uh, subjective perspective of what is happening in the community. So we are building out these practices to become better at understanding community health. We're also building a stronger foundation through metrics. And in the Chaos Project, just to give a little background, when we started the project, we had, we started collecting a list of metrics that everyone was interested in. It was a really long list. And in defining them, we decided to split up into working groups that had specific focusy, focuses, foci. The diversity and inclusion working group looks at metrics to understand how welcoming and inclusive our community is and having metrics around that. The risk working group looks at communities and projects and under, to understand what is the business risk. I don't want to be stuck with a project that I've used as an organization in my innovation stream, and then suddenly I'm left with maintaining it myself. So we want to understand that. Or license risk. We want to make sure that there's compatibility in the licenses, and it's compatible with not only inside the project, but also when we use it ourselves. We want to understand the evolution. This is the third working group. 
is a project growing? Is it already mature or is it in decline? Understanding the activity levels and how that fits in with the history and the story of the community is super important. The value working group asks questions around what's the value? What's the business value, monetary value for organizations? What about for individual contributors? Is there value in contributing to a specific project or community? Maybe there is because there are job postings out there for skills that I can build in this community. Or what's the social or the broader value for society? Is this community project make an impact in the world? And then we have common metrics. This is a working group where uh, we sometimes call it the working group for the misfit metrics that don't fit anywhere else or that have broader implications like understanding what organizations our contributors work for. Understanding this organization affiliation then helps us to identify other areas like the risk or diversity inclusion. And so that's where the common working groups come in. Now, building out metrics is great because it gives us a shared language to talk about community health. When we have different communities that we're looking at, we can start to use the same set of metrics. Even if we're not doing the analysis ourselves, we can start comparing what's happening in open source communities with others. So we're building up the stronger foundation. And then the chaos project is also helping us move faster by embedding what we are learning in software. And the software is where we put routines for collecting data. We identify the data sources and solve the problem of collecting the data. We're solving the issue of how do we present the data, the metrics, the analytics to users so that you can start doing that more quickly. We can also trial new metrics and ideas and practice because sometimes someone comes to the Chaos Project and says, hey, I'm really interested in understanding this part of our community. What is the data? What is the metrics we can be looking at? And by putting that in software, we can start to see it and then iterate on that. Now we have three projects, the Grimoire Lab project, the Argo project, and Regit. And they're being used on a daily basis by professionals in companies, in communities, in foundation. Um, Grimoire Lab, for example, has Biturgia as a company that provides services around this project. And I know the open GIF community has a dashboard that is powered by Grimoire Lab. Augur is also being used by companies like Twitter or VMware. And then Kregit is a tool that allows to see, like get blame who has changed something in the source code, but not at the line level, it goes down to the token level or who introduced this variable or edited it last. And that is heavily used by the Linux kernel community. So VF software, it's out there available for everyone to use. And through our work on becoming better, stronger, faster together, we have learned several things that I want to share with you. If you're thinking about starting your metrics journey or if you're already looking at metrics and analytics for community health, we recommend or we have seen that it's really important to listen what is happening in the community. And you can start doing this by collecting everything. You don't know what in two months and three months, what kind of data you want to look at because your focus changes, your, um, you're start, starting to change your perspective. You're having new questions all the time. So make sure that you have the data available to ask those questions of the data. And 
when you start to ask questions of the data, we have found it really useful to use the goal question metric approach, GQM. Start with what you want to accomplish as a community, as a foundation, as a company, and ask yourself, what do I need to know whether or not I'm reaching that goal or that can help me find the way for reaching that goal? And that is where the metrics then come in. And using the goal question metric approach gives a direct rationale for why am I looking at this data point. But data by itself, or metrics by themselves, or nice pretty graphs are not enough. We need to tell a story with the data. Community health is very context driven. And let's say we are looking at a graph that shows the number of new issues in the project have gone up. That can be a good thing or a bad thing. Maybe there are more and more users who are asking questions, which can be good. But maybe it means the last release had a lot of bugs and they're being reported. Or maybe it's not even related to the project. Maybe it's a Google Sum of Code is coming up and there are more students interested in the project and that's why there are more and more issues. So you need to understand the community and the context around it and then use the data to tell that story. A word of advice or caution here is to avoid gaming of metrics. If you have incentives around metrics, let's say once you hit 100 commits on the code base, you're being recognized as a frequent contributor. People will start to change their behavior to hit those metrics and commits, if you've contributed to a repository, you know you can make small and big commits. You can have thoughtful commits that touch a lot of different files, or you can separate them out into multiple commits. And once you have that metric, the incentive is to contribute a lot of commits, whatever it takes. And that might distract from actually accomplishing the goal of developing quality software or documentation or whatever the community needs. And that leads into the next point. You want to value all contributions because it's easy to look at the commit history and focus on that. But a healthy open source project and community has a lot of different types of contribution. We need marketers who advertise our project. We need people who help in forums answer questions. A bug triaging is very important so that the people who can answer know which issues to focus on versus the ones who can actually dive into the code and need to do debugging. So open source projects and communities have a lot of different work that needs to be done and we want to find data that represents all of this different work. So with that, it's I, I know there's a lot of recommendations here. Just when you have when you if you're not there yet, just start the metric journey. Start collecting all the data. It's better to have something than nothing. Get off zero. And keep these recommendations in mind or come back to the chaos project later. Um, and I'm going to hand this over to Matt Germanprey to talk about how the Chaos Project can help you. Thanks, Georg. Great. Um, so I, just to kind of reiterate a few things. So thanks, Georg. That's this was great. So um, the Chaos community is is not just a single super expert, but we're a collection of people with an interest and a passion to think about open source community health. So we encourage you to come and be part of part of that team, right? Be part of that um, part of that group that's investigating this, and together we can start understanding this uh, complex issue in more detail. So that's really important. Um, and as Georg pointed out, one of the real key things in the Chaos Project is we. We don't just develop metrics for metric sake, right? And so one of the things that we've learned is that there's kind of a push to um, develop metrics just right out of the gate, um, but they're not provided 
kind of that goal question metric. We don't know what the goal of the metric is. We don't understand the context. So we take a, a considerably more systematic approach towards developing metrics, which is kind of first thinking about why we might even, what we need to understand in the first place. And from there we have um, the development of metrics that can inform that. Um, the CAS project also works really hard, as, Ga uh, as Georg mentioned, on practices. So we work to draw out um, hard to see metrics. So some metrics are observable in trace data, like uh, Git repositories, right? Um, and others are, are considerably more difficult to see. Um, so for example, around our work in diversity and inclusion. Um, so not only does the chaos project uh, develop software to help bring those trace data metrics forward, um, but also um, practices or processes to bring those, I'll say non-trace data metrics forward as well. So we don't want the metrics just to live in isolation. We don't just develop those metrics and say, you know, done. And so we work on these things as well. And then as, as also as Garrett pointed out, context does matter, right? So it's, it's challenging in the chaos project for, for us to ever say, and we won't, that this is a healthy project and this is an unhealthy project. That's not the goal of the chaos project. So our, our goal is to give you the tools by which you can then make that assessment locally as an important um, decision for yourself. Right, so context does matter. So, right, if we're just thinking about Red Hat, Red Hat has probably a few open source projects they care about, right? <laughs> but I, I would suspect that they are not all understood in the same way, right? So a metric in community A might be, um, might have a very different impact than that same metric in community B. So it's really up to, to, to the individuals in their local context to understand um, and think about what those metrics mean. So just wanted to reiterate some of those points and we can talk about those, those more as well. Um, so there are a lot of ways that you can connect with, with the chaos project. So um, I, I'll give a nod here to Georg and many other people, but they've been um, really making some great advancements on the, the, the chaos cast. Um, so this is a, a weekly podcast in um, from the chaos project that brings different people from outside of the chaos project, sometimes internal to the chaos project, to think about what open source community health can mean to them, right? And so it's, it's great. Um, it gives you a look under the hood at the project itself, but it also gives you um, a look as to, to how the work um, is having an impact beyond just the project itself. Um, one of the things that we think about um, metrics is, is, is building blocks. So at the moment, I, we have 40 some odd metrics that are released as part of the current release. And the expectation isn't that you would use every single metric to analyze community health um, for your particular interests, uh, but that you can assemble those blocks accordingly in your own context. Um, I, I do think one of the things that we're gonna think about in the chaos project is as our number of metrics continues to grow, how do we provide uh, appropriate filters so that those building blocks are put together in, in meaningful ways. So um, that's uh, one of the things that we're starting to take on right now. Um, software can be, the software that Georg mentioned can be really an, an important way for you to start um, seeing this trace data uh, in, in kind of a time history. So you can start looking at it over time. You can look at the evolution of things. And in fact, you can start even comparing projects between each other. So if there's an aspirational project that you might have an interest in. Tooling can help kind of reveal uh, how an aspirational project is performing and how you might want to think about your own activity within your projects. Um, and then the chaos community, right? I kind of mentioned this, we're not, we're not just a single super expert. We're a collection of people who are trying to, trying to understand what's going on in this space. Um, and the chaos community can serve as a place for you to ask questions, um, for you to advance your own initiatives. We're, we're very open um, to ideas from all different different directions. Next slide. Um, so get involved at the podcast, right? Um, take a look at the, at the metrics that we have. So if you just go to chaos.community uh, slash metrics, you'll see the current release. We're gonna be doing a new release uh, in about six weeks um, from now. 
contribute to the software, as, as Georg pointed out, are all um, pretty accessible and, and pretty easy to contribute to. Um, and then we have weekly uh, working group meetings. So each of the working groups that Georg had listed earlier has weekly or biweekly meetings. Uh, we have a weekly community call. The software groups have their own calls. And we have an Asia Pacific call as well that uh, meets every other week. Um, join our mail list. Nice activity on there. And, you know, come let us know what you're thinking about community health. So together, <laughs> that is now replaced with the chaos community. That's us, right? So help us build this better, stronger, faster. Um, help us build a, a better way of understanding community health. We're, we're listening. We're not just pushing our ideas, right? We're trying to capture the ideas that people have because a lot of people um, have thought about this for a long time. Next slide. And so I think we're going to be moving into a live chat. Is that right? Right now, I'm not sure how you want to proceed with this. Right. Yeah. So uh, thank you for for the great presentation. There are a couple of comments now in Twitch. I can see. So then I will I will start with you the the question. So then we can start uh, with the open discussion and the ask me anything. So anyone here in in the chat, Twitch, or any other platform, please feel free. Uh, to ask anything. So uh, specifically, the what, what the question we have is, uh, and I'm literally uh, reading here, the way I do analysis and visualization doesn't follow this approach. This is focused on, on having all of the data in one place. And this is, what do I need to, uh, so the, the question he has is, what do I need to measure and can I measure it? So that's my first question. So uh, it says grabbing all the data first before I have a question sets up an expensive game board for gaming. So I don't know if you have an opinion or comment. I first of all want to welcome Vicky. Uh, hi, Vicky. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. Hi, Vicky. Happy to do so. Yeah, thank you, Vicky, for, for joining. Well, indeed, now uh, Kakuri, the, the one specifying this, this is, it wasn't a question. I have an answer to that. So, but in any case, go ahead. Uh, okay. Yeah, go ahead, Gail, please. So the question of what to measure is really a question of what is your goal, what you need the metrics and data for. And without knowing that first, we can we can make a recommendation of 40 plus metrics that we have in the Chaos Project right now, but without actually knowing why you're looking at metrics in the first place, it's hard to narrow that down and not drown in data. Because once you start opening the data fire hose, you'll, there's so much to take in. So that's, I, it's really hard to give a recommendation here. That's my opinion. Well, and I think something that people, first of all, is my microphone on. It does appear to be so oh, yeah. excellent. Um, so. One thing that people, I think, forget when they're considering data um, is that they already have the data. It's simply not assembled. The vast majority of data that you are going to be using for this metric, uh, these metrics, it's generated, right? You can gather it from various sources on the fly. And yes, it will take time to do so, but you are creating it through the acts of your community. And so, you don't necessarily have to flip the switch and start assembling it right then. So if it's you are worried about having data overload, right, and getting just buried in too many data, just wait and take that time to figure out what you actually do want. What are your goals? And that's the primary problem I've seen almost every single project, hell, every single co uh, company I've worked with, is they don't answer the question, what are we trying to accomplish here? And if you don't have that answer, then you can't see whether you're even on track for it, right? If you can't answer what success looks like, then you can't identify failure. So if you don't figure out your goals, obviously you're never going to pick the right metrics, right? You're just going to be floundering in this sea of data and you will die that way. And that's just not a good way to uh, go through your world. 
I'll add one thing as well. Georg had mentioned a phrase that we use in the chaos project quite a bit is just to move off zero. So the chaos project doesn't have some magical set of metrics that is the perfect set that is the end of the line. If right, if you can measure and understand all of these metrics, great. Um, so sometimes it's it's really just small steps, I would say, which would help with mm -hmm. this reducing the sea of data that's out in front of you. Just ask questions about issues, ask questions about pull requests, very simple questions, mm -hmm. and see if they help you make more informed decisions over time. Well, one of the things that I've found very helpful, um, and uh, it sounds like a pitch, but it's not because I've legitimately found it really helpful, um, is uh, Viterja launched Cauldron earlier this year, cauldron.io. And um, the public dashboard for cauldron.io does not have every metric under the sun for a free and open source software project. Um, so for people who don't know, um, uh, cauldron.io is a service which you can use for any free and open source software project to gather stats and data and metrics and display them to people and just sort of track various uh, metrics over time. Um, and it is just absolutely brilliant. It's super useful. But it does start from just those sorts of things that nearly everyone's going to care about, right? What's your number of contributions over time? Um, who are the companies or where are people coming from to contribute to your project, right? Even those bare bones basic things are incredibly useful. And as Matt said, you know, and, and Georg, get off zero. The way I phrase it is baby steps are still steps. Right. So even taking one tiny small movement to gather something or to get something going can help to set the mindset of the entire community around paying attention to the, these numbers in some way. And um, and Cauldron has really helped a great deal with that. As I show it to communities, they're like, oh, wow, we can actually see this stuff a bit. I would say I love it. Yeah. Oh, go ahead, Georg. You were going to say. Oh, no, I, I was waiting for you to ask the next question. And if not, I have questions as well to discuss. Oh, yeah, having, having questions is great. So I just, I just wanted to share with you. So um, I think it was in some ask on years ago, we were in one of these, uh, um, I don't remember where exactly, but uh, there, there was a question like, what's, what's the metric that matter to you? And we were an audience of 30 or 40 people, and we had like 20 something different metrics. Um, so th there are two lessons learned here. The first one is uh, take care with the metric that you are kind of retrieving, because perhaps you have not considered the specific cultural goals or business goals or community goals that you are trying to reach. So that's something to first think on on those high level stuff, and then forget about measuring things for the pleasure of measuring things because that's that's the other lesson learned because oh i i'm basing my my decision making because i'm able to analyze commits but not for instance the uh, pull request or diversity and inclusion in my community and because I, i'm not able to analyze that then I'm, I'm basing my my strategy on this data but it doesn't make sense because then you are basing in some kind of bias data which is kind of the previous discussion we had like, are we using the proper data sources? So the question I have for you is if you feel that we are missing some uh, important data points in, in kind of the usual chaos community or analysis that we are running either in Caldron or, a, or any, any other tool that you may use. Who starts? <laughs> uh, I can start. So um, one of the things that we're looking at in the value working group and Kara had alluded to it was um, the ability, say, for example, of a project to have social impact or a positive social impact in the world, which could be particularly important um, in today's state of the world. Um, how do we go about doing that is a that's a very difficult question. And so what would what's the goal? What are the questions and what are the metrics? So um, the data doesn't just jump out at me as to what that might be. Um, so I, I think that in the chaos project, though, th through talking and listening, we can help figure out what might be that meaningful data. So I do think there's some data that's perhaps m more evident 
as evident through, say, a GitHub repository. And some which is harder to, to track down, it's, it's not impossible, but we, we have to think through carefully um, what that data could be. So, yes, yeah, certainly. Um, I'll say one other thing too, is as we look in, if we look in, in the, uh, say, corporatized open source space, um, the data that's available there might be very different than the data that's available, say, in a scientific software space. And so what that data is and what it means can be, can be very different things. So the, the provenance of that data and, and, and what that data can mean for, for, um, for an ecosystem, it, 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 it can be very different in, in different spaces. And I think it's worth kind of reinforcing something that Daniel mentioned, um, which is I've seen frequently people who uh, kind of uh, let the cart lead the horse, so to speak. Um, you know, we have this data, and so therefore this is what we're going to use to make all of our decisions rather than figuring out what decisions we need to make and then what data do we need in order to do that. Um, and it's, I, I understand the desire, you know, when, but just because all you have is a hammer does not make everything a nail. So um, there are these things called hardware stores where you can go and you can get other tools that will allow you to get your job done appropriately. Same thing for your metrics and your data. Right? Um, and it does make sense rather than just using your one hammer, allowing that to guide what sort of house you build. Go out and buy yourself a decent, you know, table saw and, you know, maybe one of those really cool pneumatic nail guns and things like that, right? There are different things you can use there. And that's something that I don't think people pay a lot of attention to. Um, it's not the exactly exactly the question that you gave to us, Daniel, um, but I thought it was worth reinforcing because it is a problem I see a lot of companies and a lot of projects make if they care about data at all, or if they pay attention to data at all, which is really the first hurdle, getting them to, to uh, recognize that this is something they should even pay attention. And so that's a question I would like to put to um, your Matt and Daniel, since you're here, right? Um, how, what are these strategies you have found to work to help to um, evolve community thinking such that they will pay attention to data? and no. do it appropriately rather than just like any data in the storm sort of thing, right? In in your metaphor, chaos basically is the hardware store then? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I like that. Um, so how, how do we, how do we look at the data? One of the things just to talk about the, the origin of data, Vicky had pointed out that a lot of data is available just from the traces of our communities, but we under, need to understand why those traces were created in the first place and what shaped that. And this is something that Jape had talked about at the end of the previous session, that we need to understand how the data was created before we draw conclusions from it. Understanding the context and the community is super important. And then there's other data that may require a survey or manual data collection or completely new data collection methods. And then uh, what, how do we get started with metrics? How do we get people to care is something that we are, we are thinking through in the chaos project. And one of the things that we've started doing is having user groups where we have, so we started one for the app ecosystem after scale. And so these are folks from the GNOME Foundation, from the KDE Foundation and Chaos, and we get together and we're like, okay, so we want metrics, we know we need them, and what what is it that we should recommend to the people who are in different roles within our foundations. Um, and the app ecosystem working group is really focused in this case on managing or overseeing many different communities because it's a different use case from a company or from a single project. So that, that came to mind. 
but I don't think it solves the problem of how do you get people interested in the metrics in the first place. I, I do think one of the things, and hopefully this is working, um, in the chaos project, just even with the different working groups, so having one working group focusing on, say, DNI, one working group focusing on risk, one on evolution, right off the bat, that helps kind of segment areas of metrics that you may or may not have an interest in. Um, within each of the working groups themselves, so for example, within DNI, uh, we have focus areas. And so one focus area in DNI would be, um, say, event DNI or event based DNI. So, and then the metrics that would help uh, reveal DNI with respect to events. And so, again, that helps localize a series of metrics that can provide insight into a very particular area. So, we've taken time to kind of structure the chaos project that it's not just a grab bag of metrics, but, but structuring them to be meaningful as a collection. Yeah, and um, I would like to, to 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 answer here as well. So first, I think it's it's been really useful to to have everyone in the discussion uh, at the same time in the same place, well, or virtual place, because that helps to have a feeling of ownership when you are defining metrics. And instead of working at the level of individuals, try to work at the level of teams. So then you are in a team or in a community, and then you are trying to improve by unblocking certain undesired situations or looking to improve uh, bottlenecks, et cetera, et cetera. So if we all define certain metrics, we are bringing uh, to the table all of the different points of view. So we have a voice there defining this. And we all know that if, if there's a way to, to improve this or there's we need to tune the metrics in somehow, we, we all have a voice again. So we can keep iterating those metrics. Of course, metrics from time to time, we need to improve them or, you know, elaborate them a bit more or simply dismiss them because they are not useful anymore. But those are those are a couple of interesting things. Uh, the, the other thing is uh, context and skills. And, and with this, I would like to bring back Diane. Diane, I hope you're around because uh, we are kind of running out of time. But I would like to, to bring her because one of the things or the the lessons learned that we have we have together, thank you, hello Diane, is uh, this difference between context knowledge, that in this case is Diane, and, and certain data knowledge, that, that is my, my part. So when we've been working together, it's really, really important to avoid pitfalls or, or similar stuff, to have this context knowledge or domain knowledge, and then the other knowledge might be uh, more data related stuff, so where the data is, is stored and everything. So those are my two cents here. I, I, I'd agree with that um, and putting me on the spot a little bit, but I think the, the and, and you know, going back to the previous talk as well, is that um, having some domain expertise around the data and understanding um, the shortcomings of the data as well um, has been um, has been a key part in some of the research that Daniel and I have done um, on the CNCF community as well. And, uh things you know things that are missing in our data that we've we've noted and haven't quite figured out the workarounds for but we're working around it's like um diff, you know diversity information around the data how to identify that how to do that um securely and privately with in you know when people aren't sharing that information that's um a big you know it's it's an issue for us to better create diverse and inclusive in communities, but it's also a privacy issue as well. So um, like we have de-anonymized the organizations for a lot of the people that are part participating in our OpenShift Commons uh, work, uh, that hasn't happened in all of the other ecosystems as well. Some work that we've been doing in um, COVID um, up here in Canada, uh, they um, don't have any diversity background information on the patients so they're not getting the breakdown by race or ethnicity or um, you know all kinds of other things because they don't actually have that information and that's that's I think one of the bigger issues I think with a lot of our um, kind of dependency on people self-identifying um, and and that's a good thing people should have we should respect their privacies but it's also makes it harder to uh, understand all the dynamics um, of the data and to not let the data influence or drive our decisions 
if we if we know we don't have that information. I think that's one of the key learnings um, from from the work that Daniel and I have done, and I think the work that all of us have done, and and what um, Jabe and Demije have um, reiterated earlier today. So I think that's that's key, and I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I don't think any of us do. I think we're all in this um, conversation together about how we do this and bring in other other um, means, other other hammers, so that we're not you know just hitting nails and screws. And even if you're up here in Canada, you have Phillips and Roberts and all kinds of different screw heads. I mean, it's like there's such diversity in in our communities, but we're in some ways prohibited from um, exposing that information for good reasons. Um, but it still makes it difficult. So I don't know how you guys um, think about that and address that. Um, but I think that's also another whole day's worth of conversations. So <laughs> on, on that note, um, maybe if you guys have some final thoughts, um, add them in. Mine is simply a thank you. <laughs> Thanks for letting yeah. us talk about this. This is great. Yeah, uh, I really appreciate it. Yeah, well, thank you, because really the whole impetus for doing today was um, the cancellation of ChaosCon and um, Daniel and I having a conversation about um, how important your work was and um, that, you know, we really wanted to continue that conversation. So we'll, we'll do this again and often. So thank you very much, guys, for all of this.